Okay, we are live. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Deanna Shemek. I direct the Center for Early Cultures here at UCI, and I want to welcome everybody to our first lunchtime series uh, talk for this quarter and for this academic year. Uh, before we go any further, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Environmental Humanities, and also the Department of English. Today, as you know, we have uh, Dr. Abby Ang, who's going to be giving a talk for us. I want to um, allow my colleague, Elizabeth Allen, professor of and chair of the English department here to introduce her as a fellow medievalist. I will say that uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's own most recent book is a beautiful uh, volume called Uncertain Refuge Sanctuary in uh, the Literature of Medieval England. And I, I hope you'll all go, go get that. It's uh, out just this year from University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, one more little item before I turned everything over to Elizabeth is just to ask you to mark your calendars. The winter event that we have for this series will be Professor Kyle Grady of our own English department here at UCI, and he'll be speaking for us on February 3rd at noon. So please mark your calendars. And with that, uh, Elizabeth. Hi. Thank you, Deanna, and I'm excited to um, introduce Abby Ang. Um, she is a research analyst researching climate and housing policy at the Center for Popular Democracy in support of grassroots organizations as they advance policy on the federal, state, and local levels. Through CPD, she published two reports in October 20, uh, 2022, Pharma's Failed Promise, Exposing the Industry's Environmental Degradation in Puerto Rico, and Sharks in the Water, Renters on the Limits of Emergency Rental Assistance. As a medievalist, she currently looks at how representations of human and insect encounters in 12th to 15th century medieval English literature engaged larger ethical debates on curiosity and community care. Her theoretical interests include critical animal studies, environmental humanities, and mutual aid. She earned a PhD in English literature from Indiana University in Bloomington, and her dissertation was titled Careful Curiosity, Insect and Human Encounters in Latin and Vernacular Texts of Medieval England. So Abby, welcome. Sorry about that. I was just trying to find the unmute button. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to finally get a chance to present on my work um, at here at UC Irvine. And I'm a bit sorry that I can't be there in person. So I'm going to start with an image. And um, I probably won't be able to see the chat, but um, here on the PowerPoint, I have an image. And I, if you have access to the chat and are able to type into it, um, I'm interested in what what you think you see. Hmm. Can we also call out? <laughs> yes, actually, that would make that might be better. Like, <laughs> can you if you could read the uh, um answers in the chat as well yeah, sure. um, um somebody says a man shitting <laughs> good guess yep so or a man yeah. sleeping it looks like he's sort of asleep <laughs> draped garment reclining we have a few some good yes um so some good guesses here so this illuminated manuscript is the 
very richly illustrated um, BN Arsenal 3142 manuscript of Marie de France's fables. And so scholars have regarded this manuscript as unusual, not only for its depictions of the author itself, herself, but also for the illuminations that precede every fable. So at the beginning of this fable called The Peasant and the Beetle, the first thing the reader sees is this large initial D, which is the first letter of the fable. It's about an inch around with flourishes around the edges reaching into the center of the page. A peasant sits in the middle of the initial on the ground with his face turned to the right and away from the reader and with his head leaning on his left arm. His back is to the reader and his little, his smock um, peasant garment is lifted up, exposing his butt. And nestled between his butt cheeks, it's not, it's not poop, it's a small grayish brown beetle contrasting against the paleness of his bare skin, and the sky is illuminated with gold leaf. So this manuscript initial might have immediately piqued medieval readers' curiosity, um, just as it might have piqued yours, by asking them to literally look closely at the scene. What is between this man's butt cheeks and how did it get there? And so start reading to find out. So for readers of this particular manuscript, the D would have been the first thing that they saw offering this kind of entryway into the fable. So this it forms a literal window or frame with a scene with the beetle at the center. And there's going to be more about windows in a little bit. So in this talk, I refocus attention on the beetle as this initial does to gain new purchase and curiosity is a critical term in both medieval and animal studies. And when species meet, Donna Haraway embraces curiosity as our first obligation to companion species. She argues that in order to unlock more ethical forms of engagement with animals, one must be curious about the what about what the animals we come face to face with are doing, feeling, and thinking. And such curiosity is tested in Marie's fables. In the two fables I'll be looking at, the peasant and the beetle and the beetle and the wolf, curious beetles crawl in and out of the anuses of a peasant and a wolf, respectively. The ensuing mayhem poses a question that many environmental hum humanists are considering. Is it possible to be companion species with insects, many of whom may annoy and irritate us, but as they urge their readers to look attentively at the beetles going in and out of these butts, the fables negotiate several key questions. What can we learn when we pay close attention rather than simply accepting what we're told? And who is worthy of attention and why? So I'm going to start with a brief overview of Marie's fables as a genre in case people are not familiar. And then I'll turn to reading The Peasant and the Beetle to discuss how the first of Marie's Beetle fables opens a window into epistemological questions about what we see and what kinds of knowledge result. And then I expand a bit further with an account of The Wolf and the Beetle, which uses the linkages between curiosity and the word engine or ingenuity towards resourceful collective action and coalition building. So a little bit of a brief background. Marie de France's fables are were written near the end of the 12th century in England. They're written in Anglo-Norman French. And I do apologize in advance for absolutely going to be butchering the Anglo-Norman French. Um, there's about 102 fables, and they're drawn from various sources, various very diverse sources. And the form tends to be a short story um, followed by moral instruction. Pretty standard if you familiar with fables growing up. So critical animal studies scholars have often read the fable genre as merely pressing animals into human shapes. In The Animal That Therefore I Am, Jacques Derrida himself states, uh, we know the history of fabulization and how it remains an anthropomorphic taming, a moralizing subjection, a domestication. Always a discourse of man, on man, indeed on the animality of man, but for and in man. His assumptions about the fables tend to foreclose the possibility that they are impelled by any curiosity about animals. Tracking Marie de France's fables through an animal studies perspective, Susan Crane mentions that these works may, quote, easily seem inhospitable to animal studies, end quote. She notes that the form of the genre performs a disappearing act with animals. She says, quote, in the fables move from narrative to apologue, so the story to the, um, the moral, the beasts of narrative are useful in that they illuminate human ways, but they are of no interest beyond that usefulness, end quote. And according to readings um, of fable genre, the fable genre 
sharply divides human from animal as it kind of absorbs animal bodies into this kind of morality. The animal body disappears in favor of the development of human bodies of knowledge about human bodies, um, about human morals and bodies. But my reading follows scholars who in the years since have tended to push against this assessment of fable to note the ways in which the genre tends to be curious about animal behavior. And there's also a renewed interest um, as my advisor Patricia Ingham has often spoken about, about the etymological links between curiosity and cura or care, which is um, grounded in a number of different medieval wide ranging debates about the vice of cur curiosity is a misplaced version of caring versus other forms of curiosity may, that may be more proper. Um, so Patricia Ingham's assessment of fable in her book, The Medieval New, describes it as a genre that models a kind of cleverness desirable in any student of logic and grammar, as well as the use of vulnerable animals using wit to outsmart stronger persecutors, enemies, or pursuers, end quote. And one of my colleagues, Julie K. Chamberlain's work on Marie de France's fables also draws in Ingham's work to argue that these fables reveal a, quote, self-reflexive curiosity coupled with a weariness over its applications, end quote. Her readings show that the curiosity in the fables is deployed with this kind of ethical voice extending to consideration of the suffering of other creatures. So following, drawing on many of um, this many of these scholars work, um, I argue that in The Peasant and the Beetle, Marie uses the beetle's foray into this man's anus to expose idle curiosity and knowledge based on vanity. In the short tale, a beetle crawls up a peasant's anus while he sleeps. The ensuing pain impels the man to see a doctor who informs him that he is pregnant. Amazed, his fellow country folk gather to watch the birth, only to see the beetle crawl out. At face value, this fable might exemplify general anxiety surrounding insects and pregnancy in general, as noted from the man's encounter with the beetle. The tale features a lot of looking, so the beetle looks into the man's butt. The villagers look at the man and the beetle. Marie uses the beetle as a focal point to kind of orient the reader towards what we see and what we should be curious about. I also argue that the fable's emphasis on sensory experience, particularly sight, engages medieval understandings about the role of curiosity to show the benefits of looking deeply while denouncing not only the absence of curiosity, but also misplaced forms of curiosity. So I, um, I had the link to the fables emailed ahead of time. Um, but I was wondering if, if it hasn't been done so already, if um, someone could um, drop the link into the chat as well, so people could follow along. Um, we stop. did mail them out, um, Abby, but I'll go ahead and um, look up that link and go ahead and stick it in the chat unless Akua has it. It'll take me a second, but um, we but we did um, share it, so I'll um, put it in the chat, no problem. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, at this um, at this point, I'm like, I'm also putting it up on the screen because I think um, I'm going to put a pause on this slide on sharing the other slides. Can everyone see that? It's probably not really that we easy. We can see, see it. Yes, thanks. Yes. That's great. It's fine. Okay, yeah. great. Um, this this looks okay. So this fable points out the ways in which the human characters are unable to see and are disconnected from the knowledge that sensory perception can give them, from the peasant at the beginning of the fable to the doctor who misdiagnoses him. The peasant is not only asleep when the beetle crawls into him, but he's also lying face down in line three. Beyond allowing the insect access to his anus, his prone position compounded by his unconscious state emphasizes his lack of sight during this encounter. Though the man's great pain suggests pain resulting from the beetle's incursion, the doctor declares that he's pregnant. This diagnosis results from the doctor's failure or inability to use his sight, for he does not look more closely at the man's body and coming up with other possibilities. So regardless of whether the man's body can actually carry a baby to term, the doctor's assumptions also seem based on a rationale that associates this kind of pain with only one thing, pregnancy. The doctor's failure to be curious resonates with the ways in which Haraway critiques the failure of other critical animal studies scholars to be curious. So she indicts, I'm turning back here, um, the ways in which Derrida forestalls curiosity in his encounters with his cat. She argues that Derrida, quote, failed the simple, simple obligation of companion species. He did not become curious about what the cat might actually be doing, feeling, thinking, or perhaps making available to him and looking back at him. 
Alternatively, she posits that curiosity is the key to species interdependence as it allows us to unlock alternative forms of engagement scientifically, biologically, and therefore also philosophically and intimately. According to Haraway, to have a lack of curiosity about animals would be to shut out the possibilities of being in the world, as being curious is crucial to a continued coexistence. So the beetle, the peasant and the beetle uses the doctor to critique the role of authority figures in generating narratives about the body that close off other inquiries or, or observations. Such narratives are conveyed through language and also speak to the power of language to misinform. The language of the fable emphasizes the talking that occurs as the forms of the verb to speak in lines eight and nine. The peasant recounts and speaks to the doctor, the peasant then believes the doctor. The doctor's verbal diagnosis also functions as an authorizing voice that singles the peasant's present body out as different, as a man who can give birth. Forms of the word believe also populate the fable. The peasant believes the doctor's diagnosis. The villagers worry that the man's lack of belief causes pregnancy, and the moral concludes with a critique of those who believe that which cannot be. The repetition of this word belief in those who believe that which cannot be suggests the dangers too of believing too quickly without being curious to ask more questions. In fact, the failure to be curious about what the beetle is doing also has negative consequences for this man. The words fear and dread emphasize the villagers' fear of what his body could mean as they believe that it holds some meaning or sign that might lead to great pain for them in turn. And in line with contemporaneous tales and male pregnancy was a sign or a poison beyond itself, the people's fear of this great um, pain suggests that the man's own great pain from his lack of faith could be contagious, spreading beyond the boundaries of his body to infect the community. The peasants assume that misfortune, supposedly the result of faith and true, would be their due. And the, this repetition, again, of the word belief throughout the fable speaks to the villagers' desire to force the man back into this frame that accords with a sense of how the world works, which renders his body as either this omen of great pain to come or the result of a lack of faith. And this tension between belief and sensory experience in this fable aligns with how medieval thinkers constantly rethought curiosity as described in Richard Newhouse's work on the sin of curiosity. According to Newhauser, vitium curiositas appeared in lists of vices as a means of curbing humanity's right to free and limitless speculation. He cites Isidore, who speaks of this as an excessive curiosity for knowing hidden things. And some moralists saw those who believed this truth value of sensory perception as sinning by curiosity. Augustine, in fact, whom Newhauser calls a first great theoretician of curiosity, explained curiosity as, quote, indicative of a frivolous search for knowledge that turns the soul away from the contemplation of the eternal. He urges readers not to seek knowledge of what is visible and temporal, but of what cannot be seen and is eternal. So if the senses cannot be trusted, then the question is, of course, whether medieval writers could ever properly look at animals to gain any valu valuable knowledge. Isidore himself warns readers that excessive curiosity, quote, topples the mind into sacrilegious fables, end quote. Such renderings of curiosity tend to distrust the value of sensory perception and urge people, readers to believe more in dogma, especially of the church. But it's not simply excessive curiosity that is at stake, but rather misplaced curiosity. The villagers in the fable seem to practice excessive curiosity in ways that many medieval thinkers would criticize. The fable thus probes the difference between looking that is productive and looking that is not. So Isidore whining readers to avoid excessive curiosity could also be demonstrated by slanderers and people who listen to rumors, which manifest in like leaving off your care for another's life, not caring about other people. Um, building on the doctor's diagnosis, the villagers manifest this kind of curious but unproductive staring. These stares of the, Marie calls them the foolish people, extend the doctor's original diagnosis as they construct this man's body as fearful. Um, the words like watch for the purpose to know, in order to know in line 20, um, emphasize the ways in which sight is supposed to lead to knowledge, but the assumptions about what this strange body might mean seem to override any pursuit of knowledge, and based on the assumptions about what he's done to deserve such a fate, seem more related to what Isidore would call looking into the character of another, unmindful of your own character. 
Furthermore, the stakes of the doctor's misdiagnosis coupled with the villagers' stares have the result of making the man feel much worse beyond his physical state of having a beetle in his butt. They read the birth as this omen of great harm, and then the way they look and the assumptions they make produce additional pain for him. But in contrast to the human figures, the beetle is able to see in ways they cannot. The word of birth in line four holds associations not only as an opening itself, but also as, as Harriet Spiegel's translation emphasizes, is something that can be seen clearly, clearly viewed by the beetle. Marie uses the word window or um, fenestra to describe the beetle's confrontation with this man's butt, anus. Beyond suggesting that a boundary has been breached, the word window also suggests something through which one can look inside as well as out, raising the possibility as, as inside as well as out. Raising the possibility that the beetle looks at and into the man before entering, the wood appears at the tail end of the fable as the beetle takes its leave through the window. And that's in line 22, out of the window, through the window. You said a moment when all the villagers are watching the man to see how the birth would go, this word could also suggest that the beetle is kind of looking out at the window at the people. If the man's anus is a window for the beetle, then maybe the man Maybe the beetle has made the man its home and kind of settled in. This curiously domestic moment kind of deflates the human slash peasant narratives of great pain and disaster. Position near the end of the fable as the tail moves toward its moral, the beetle, beetle also looks out of its anus window at the readers, kind of demanding a response from us. The fable's moral, importantly, does not criticize or condemn the beetle for its actions. It's just kind of doing what I suppose a beetle does. Rather than avoiding such excessive curiosity altogether, Marie enables it to be reoriented properly as the fable makes it possible to consider the beetle's perspective. Marie, by focusing attention on the beetle in this encounter, turns the villagers' misplaced curiosity to a learning opportunity for a more productive form of curiosity. Um, Newhouse describes a concern that more neutral forms of curiosity could be perverted into the sin of curiosity. But this fable shows that the reverse is also true. So as the beetle crawls out of the man's anus, thus deflating these narratives of pain, bad omens, and disaster, Marie opens a space to productively consider what the animal, in Haraway's words, might actually be doing, feeling, thinking, or perhaps making available to the peasants and the villagers and looking, end quote. Marie's fable allows both the villagers and the readers to be curious about the beetle. The fable complicates modern scholarly understandings of medieval uh, vitium curiositas and its reliance on the dangers of sensory perception too, by suggesting that sensory perception is valuable in gaining this knowledge and, show, and by showing that even moments when curiosity is misplaced can be grounded by looking carefully. In this way, a careful reader can move away from vitium curiositas toward good curiosity. So, in contrast to these curious villagers, this distinctness of the beetle offers an opportunity to be curious about it, and it does re-engage the sensory perception as having this truth value for knowledge. I'm gonna pause to take a drink of water. This fable therefore expands our understanding of medieval curiosity by reconnecting the sensory experience to belief. To see just how the baby's birth would go at line 21, offers the key to demystifying this strange event, and it's that baby's birth that the manuscript initial illuminates to the reader in the position of the villagers staring at the man's ass. The view of the beetle as it crawls back out holds the truth of the encounter. It's not a miraculous pregnancy. It's not an omen that predicts a great event or a misfortune. It's not the result of a man's misplaced belief. The moral of the fable states that the ignorant are often this way, believing that which cannot be, they swayed and chained by vanity. And the word ignorant here, like, evokes someone who does not have either the knowledge or the follow through to observe carefully. The word belief in its verb form recurs again to show that what is at issue is not belief alone, but rather belief that's rooted in vanity or emptiness. By focusing on the beetle, Marie criticizes the kind of belief that is grounded on emptiness or vanity and draws the reader towards belief that can be rooted in proper observation and the senses. Proper curiosity thus involves using one's sensory experience of the world to affect belief and not the other way around. By the, end, by the end of the fable, the beetle is not indicted for what it does. Neither does the fable victim blame the peasant. The moral of the tale is not to 
leave your butt out in the sun, just as the villagers should be more circumspect about their conclusions and whom they believe. And so here I return to the initial. The initial also positions the viewer as one of the villagers looking at the peasant's anus and the beetle coming out of it. As viewers, medieval readers would have assumed this perspective of the villager looking at the miraculous birth. Much like the fable itself as the initial asked readers to inhabit the perspective of the foolish villagers to see just how the baby's birth would go, it urges them to be curious about the scene, to not only read the fable further, but also look at the beetle itself in, in the picture. They must move beyond these staring and assumptions about disaster and misfortune to learn the truth of the beetle encounter. And like the villagers, we do not see a baby emerging, but just a beetle. And as the beetle here like peeps out from the man's window, it looks out at us as well, demanding a response. And here I turn to what, so what should that response be? In The Wolf and the Beetle, the beetle's exchange with the wolf opens a space to encourage collective action and community care, and thus attends to the way in which curiosity can summon resourcefulness that can be used to help those in great need. Um, in scholarly readings of the fables, medieval scholars tend to use like, adjectives such as lowly, so like the lowly beetle or the lowly worm, that kind of resonate with how critical animal studies scholars tend to prioritize types of, of animals that, at face value, seem easier to care for. Like repeated attention to wolves, dogs, and lions points to the ways in which insects tend to be overlooked in critical animal studies, along with reinforcing certain animals as more valuable. So Fable 65, the wolf and the beetle, directly challenges these assumptions of value. And in this tale, a beetle, once again, crawls into a wolf's anus. And I don't know, like, it is really hard to find synonyms for the word anus. So like I just keep on using it over and over. And I've, as I'm talking, I realize that I'm using it over and over. <laughs> um, so the beetle argues that insects are just as important as mammals and assembles an army of its friends, wasps, hornets, and flies to challenge the mammals. The mammals plug their butts with bandages, but to no avail as the insects are surprisingly resilient. So when a wasp stings a heart or a deer, his bandage tears off. And this beetle battle concludes with that mammals fleeing and conceding defeat, unable to protect their anuses. The moral of the fable is that those who despise smaller folk will be shamed because the small know best how to use the resources at their disposal in times of need. So in this way, the fable explores another term that scholars have linked to curiosity, engine. I think that's how it's pronounced, a word with a range of meaning across trickery, cunning, ingenuity, and cleverness. And here Marie uses the beetle to question the ways in which certain animals are valued over others. At the same time, she, uses, she deploys the ambivalence of this term as both wolf and beetle employ resources ingenuously to debate the ethics of different ways of forming community. So this fable uses the beetle and its friends to explicitly confront a value system in which the wolf values certain types of animals more than insects. When the wolf wakes up, he addresses the beetle disparagingly. The wolf's low opinion of the beetle manifests internally and externally, both in his mind and in his direct address to the beetle. And in, in line 10, like the words, um, he uses words to, to think of with great contempt. When he directly talks to the beetle, the words he uses re reinforces low and negative opinion of the insect as he uses the words wretch, despicable, unfortunate person, scoundrel, respectively. He also uses the word, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, chaitis, also means captive and prisoner, which reinforces the power the wolf believes he might have over the beetle, as though the beetle were a prisoner trapped in the anus of the wolf and not a being that can freely creep in and out. But despite the wolf's contempt, Marie focuses on seeing at the beginning of this fable to delineate the difference between simply directing a quick or cursory glance at something and giving it closer and more careful consideration. So the beetle's incursion causes the wolf to, it to notice something, notice what he otherwise would not. The um, yeah, so the line Quant Lilus Ligata Evit can be translated as when the wolf saw and noticed the beetle. 
The word guider, a form of the verb guider, recurs here as it does in the peasant and the beetle. The verb means to look at, to watch, observe, to see, or to notice. Uh, the word feet, a form of view, to see, behold, or observe, also reinforces the wolf's act of noticing the beetle. It also has the connotations of to realize or to recognize, to inspect, and to take into consideration, suggesting a closer analysis and moment of recognition. The beetle is not a creature that can be ignored. The looking back and forth in the fable and the literal response between the wolf and the beetle in these opening moments prefigures Haraway's description of how interactions with other creatures cultivate a kind of curiosity that demands respect and response. Haraway suggests that interactions among different kinds of species involve looking back at each other to hold in regard, to respond, to look back reciprocally, to notice. So what would it mean for the wolf to respect the beetle? Beyond this moment of noticing the beetle's response in line 13, directly argues for its value while decrying the ways in which beings like the wolf have looked down upon it. Uh, though Harriet Spiegel translates this section as, I'm just as good as you are, the phrase uh, can roughly be translated as truly, we have the knowledge that I have the better and finer value than you when you act with such arrogance. Um, she uses the, a word um, that means knowledge, information, to speak to the way in which knowledge is in question here and in the fables more generally, and how it is tied to questions of value. Who has this knowledge and where it came from? The Beatles' assertion that others um, know its value suggests that the wolf's arrogance is misplaced. Furthermore, the word buffet from has the added meaning of puff of wind, gust of wind, squall, describing a kind of arrogance that involves an inflated sense of one's worth and without solid evidence. The conditional quand or when shows that such knowledge is tied to the wolf's own arrogance, suggests that, suggesting that it and the wolf's ensuing behavior towards the beetle decreases its value. Arrogant behavior lessens someone's individual value rather than any inherent worth that one might assume comes with being a wolf. So in line with these questions of value, the moral supports the beetle's call to the wolf to not look down on it and to rethink assumptions about those one might assume are less significant. So reading the fable more specifically to be about animals, the word manures in line 56 means not only lesser in terms of rank as fables like these are commonly read, but also smaller in size. More than just to despise lower people, the word menu in the moral reminds the reader that this fable can be read with both the higher, lesser human hierarchy of class and the feudal system Marie writes within, as well as about actual animals. So the moral encourages intention to not just the lower class of peasants in the feudal system, but also in a literal sense, those animals that are smaller. Just because an animal is small does not mean it's insignificant, just because a peasant is lower class does not mean that they are insignificant either. But the word genius in the very last line of the fable, um, um, speaks to the connection of the word engine with curiosity. I don't know if that's in the last line, actually. Uh, sorry. So um, genius comes from the old French word engine from the Latin ingenium. It means native wit, intel native wit, intelligence, ingenuity, as well as cunning, ruse, and deceit. So scholars have noted the equivocal nature of the term as it offers both positive connotations as something that's both inventive and generative, as well as negative or used to deceive, depending on the intent of the one using it. So in line with the use of the word genius, the Beatles' demand for recognition in this fable also carries an ethical force, urging consideration, especially in times of great danger or need. The value of an engine, which the smaller or lesser folks have, is in being able to be resourceful in times of great danger or emergency. But while those who despise the smaller folk to the point of reviling them find themselves hum humiliated in times of humiliated in times of great need, the smaller folk are able to use ingenuity to help themselves. Um, Oh, I see what happened here. I was using a different translation. Not translation, a different manuscript edition. Sorry. So like some of this one says Grenu Mester. Actually, um, it's in other editions, it's, it's Genius Mester. Okay. So this can therefore mean with ingenuous skill rather than in great hardship. 
Marie's use of ingenuous skill as the last words of the fable offers her readers the promise of such ingenuity if they were to look closely rather than despising or deriding those they assume are less important. The coalition building in this fable engages this equivocal nature of engine through the allies and strategies the beetle and the wolf use. Marie offers an example of engine in action as she models two different forms of building community. The wolf and the beetle each explore this ambivalence in their own way as they test the limits of that ingenuity. While both summon their allies for the beetle battle, they employ different approaches, many of which can be recognized as ingenuous. But these strategies are not without their limits, and by showing the strengths and failures of their separate and individual schemes, Marie makes distinctions between different ethical models for engaging with each other. The wolf strategies involve a more militaristic and hierarchical style in the community he summons. Marie states in line 24, and for auxiliaries he sent to describe the way the wolf requests his allies. And the word envoy has connotations of military help of formal representatives and messengers in this government structure. To describe him instructing his army, Marie says the wolf gave his troops this information in line 30. And he suggests followers, the language here suggests followers, a retinue, implying like this kind of hierarchical relationship where he's in command of the army, while the verb ensignure means to teach or to advise, placing him in the role of one who gives instructions. And the word serfs, C-E-R-F-S, for heart, also kind of puns in the word serf, so old French word for slave, servant, non-noble. And even within the group of mammals, the wealth assembles, the lesser animals and others. The main strategy for the, the defense actually comes from that heart and can be read as another example of inventiveness and ingenuity that nevertheless has its limits. The heart suggests that the animals all use bandages to not only bind their tails, but also plug their anuses. The word estupums from the verb estupum means to stop up, to plug, to block. They protect themselves by fashioning a, a butt plug that is inserted very firmly. Um, Marie suggests the problem with this strategy, stating that each one must guide their tail. So each animal is ultimately responsible for protecting its own tail, and despite being in a community, each anus is at risk. Marie also puns on the word regard or guide, using the double meaning of the verb guider to show how the strategy involves looking at one particular area. But the verb guider also means to protect. So as the animals express concern about guiding their tails, the double meaning of the word suggests that they cannot look out for each other as each one must regard its own tail. Though it's inventive, the strategy is a singular one where each animal can only be responsible for pr protecting its own butt by looking at that one area. Though they meet collectively in troops, this kind of self-interest must play a role. But the beetle's ingenuous skill is more explicitly at play through the coalition it builds. In contrast to the wolf's more militaristic language, the beetle calls its friends and relatives rather than put on any show of military might or hierarchical relationship. It assembles its people. In line 19, the word begins. The language of the fable attends to these specific types of insects within the swarm, along with their specific qualities. The bees, the fat fly, the hornet, the good wasp, the gnat. And within this general collective, the wasp gets credit for the first move, stinging the heart in the side. But not only does it speak to the beetle's abilities for coalition building, it also exposes two different ways of building power. So one can deploy one's followers and retinue, or one can deploy one's friends and family. And the fable locates beetles not just among this community of other beetles, but also among a range of different insects. When the beetle calls the bees, not one's soul, um, Marie says in line 26, not one soul remained back of the bees or any other insect. The insects respond without hesitation to the beetle's call. And so in this fable, we see a community that values individuality as well and relationships within that community as well as individual skills, but all working together within that community. The language Marie uses to describe the insects also portrays them positively with an eye towards their particular qualities. The word gross, where the fat fly conveys this fly that's not just heavy and large, but also essential and important. And similarly, the good wasp, it carries this kind of sense of affection as it describes the wasp as like good, loyal, skilled. And rather than this abstract notion of the swarm, these depictions portray a community of insects that still maintains the particularity of each creature while affirming their value. But the word ader in the moral, in the last line of line 59, 
meaning aid or help has ramifications for understanding how to care for others, whether that be other human beings or insects. In the context of the feudal coin, Merida speaks to a critique of a more hierarchical landscape where ultimately people are self-interested guiding slash regarding themselves. In that way, the moral of the fable still holds this ethical force for the reader to aid not just other insects, but also other human beings. Though the battle ends with the two armies separate with this wolf and his entourage running away from the insects, the lesson that Marie imparts reorients us towards a way that both groups can come together. The moral focuses on the resources that the despised have at their disposal and leaves the question of aid open. It therefore not only offers the potential for the despisers to stop despising those they perceive as lesser, but grammatically it leaves the object of aid to aid indeterminate. The moral reminds the reader of the possibility of being in great danger and needing the help of resources. The indeterminacy of who should need that aid carries the promise of this coalition building of wolf and beetle, nobleman and peasant coming together to work alongside each other. The word aider thus opens questions of what it might mean to aid each other and to care for each other collectively in times of great need. This fable, as it explores the values ascribed to certain kinds of animals over others, offers a potent object lesson for modern critical animal study scholars by urging a focus not only on animals such as wolves, but also on insects. And I'm going to go to, back to the manuscript here. The initial C and in manuscript arsenal D1 Two, four models this focus in the way it presents the different animals of the fable, and some not even mentioned. There's four flying insects here, there's four mammals, and it orients the reader towards the midst of the action, literally carving out a frame for a particular moment when different species are looking at each other and engaging each other. It depicts the main players of the fable. The mammals portrayed are the stag, identifiable because of its horns, a rabbit or a hare. Actually, these are not mentioned in the fable, a wolf, and what vaguely looks like some kind of Poise, I guess. Not really sure. All four mammals face the four insects, and the stag has a bandage wrapped around its tail to show that its anus is plugged. And one insect, the wasp, eh, that stings the stag on its flank is portrayed mid sting. But rather than running away from each other, all the animals are frozen in this moment where they're facing each other head on without looking away. And all four insects have these two little eyes each, like. Like, I don't know if you can see the little round circles for their eyes. And one insect is so close to the heart's left eyeball, engaged in this intense staring match that they're literally eye to eye. And frozen in this moment of interspecies looking, this initial offers a lesson for modern critical animal studies assumptions about what kinds of animals have value and what kinds of animals are worth saving. The beetle venturing in and out of the wolf's anus gestures towards Haraway's call to understand that, quote, we are in a knot of species co-shaping one another in layers of recipro reciprocating complexity all the way down. Response and respect are possible only in these knots. The question for animal studies scholars is whether we can still build relationships with creatures that have the potential to hurt and annoy us, but are still in the current moment of species destruction due to climate change worth saving. The, the initial capturing a moment with these this heart and this insect locking eyes therefore underscores the necessity of at least not looking away. And to close, um, Anna Ching, building off Haraway's concept of curiosity in the mushroom at the end of the world, expands on the ethical states of such curiosity, especially in more explicitly stressing the urgency to be curious to combat conditions of modern precarity. Echoing Haraway, she argues that curiosity seems to me the first requirement of collaborative survival. In an age when, as she describes, precarity is the condition of our time, texts such as the bestiaries may help us, you know, texts such as the bestiaries, the fables, and so on, may help us speak to current conditions of precarity. If we're now living in an epoch where human disturbance outranks geological forces, then we have to envision what it means to survive in a time of unprecedented change. Thinking through pre precarity means the condition of being vulnerable to others and to put unpredictable encounters at the center of things and to consider narratives or kinships that have been marginalized or excluded in the human conceit for progress. Curiosity therefore can become an ethical force towards learning how to respect each other and survive together. It is a challenge towards collective care. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Abby, for that wonderful um, for that wonderful talk. I'm having trouble putting my video back on. I'm working on it, but um, uh, this is Elizabeth Allen, and um, I just want to you know let's thank Abby uh, uh, wholeheartedly for such an interesting um, talk. Um, those of you who are still here, if you can put your videos on, um, that would be great. And if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or just raise your hand and um, I will continue to work on my, on my video presence here. Uh, I could jump in just just very quickly, and this is this is basic, I guess. But so let me just let me just ask, um, you know, thinking about your uh, you know your early remarks where you invoked Derrida, Abby, um, and 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 his claim that all the fables are ultimately about humans, and then wanting to kind of um, you know move in a different direction via Haraway and seeing about um, being being curious about the animals' feelings and motivations. Um, I found that to be a really interesting move. And I wonder, um, as I thought through the two fables that, that you looked at in the talk, um, on the one hand, the second one really does, it's, you know, it has a heavy kind of allegorical um, character to it, right? It, it, it is about people and we have to sort of struggle to think about it in the terms that you're asking us to, but I think that's really valuable. Um, I wonder what you think about the the beetles motivations or desires or instincts in the first um tale because we don't know um and this seems to be also you know lying behind this there's this fear where does this fear of anal, anal penetration by beetles comes from is 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 this something everybody else knows about but me <laughs> i've never heard of it before so Oh yeah, that's a very good question. I think the beauty of it is that we, is that Marie leaves that question um, unanswered. Like we don't know what the beetle, the beetle isn't going inside. I think in both fables actually, it's not going inside the person's butt explicitly to cause, because it wants to be mean or cruel or something like that. It's just kind of, it's just kind of a thing it does. Which to me also kind of makes me wonder if this was a frequent thing that happened in the middle ages mm -hmm. of bugs getting into places that they shouldn't. And my inclination is to think that this was common to a certain extent, but mm -hmm. that's also not something that I have I know for sure that Beatles did. Mm -hmm. But I've seen it happen, like not seen it happen, but have read about it as kind of this anxiety about insects kind of probing different areas and it's just as something that happens like a natural natural kind of instinct to find a place that's dark and shady and mm -hmm. George hi thank you that was a, a terrific talk and uh, I, I've translated Marie de France before and some of her fables and they are a challenge linguistically and in many other ways so thank you for making things so clear I was going to ask you actually there's another fable about the beetle simply called the beetle you might must know it and in that one uh, the beetle is not crawling into an orifice of another creature, but is envious of being an eagle. So once again, a kind of hierarchy between two animals. And in trying to hop high enough to be able to fly like an eagle, the uh, beetle, of course, ends up being too removed from its own dung hill, and, and, uh, which was kind of evoked in your final uh, slide there, where uh, finding its way back to the dung hill is its home and the source of its nourishment, despite the fact that we all think of it as shit, you know, but but the, the beetle has that unique ability to be converting shit into nourishment. And so losing, wanting to be something else, a kind of supposedly hierarchically superior animal means losing its own basis and kind of magic powers itself. So I was, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that one in addition, because it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, she uses the beetle quite a lot in the fables, and you don't find it in other fables. Most fables 
you know, maybe, you know, there's the sort of the, uh, the grasshopper and the ant that that's one well known, but most of the time there are, you know, wolves and lambs and dogs and cats and birds and have rabbits and, you know, kind of what I would say mammaliocentric kind of view of the animal world. And, and finally, I, I agree entirely with you that I think you know, fables actually are really very often very deeply, de deeply steeped in knowledge about uh, the natural world and the animal world in particular. I mean, and, and, and there have been studies on them, for example, in, in La Fontaine's fables. And of course, La Fontaine basically translated um, Marie de France into modern French. Um, not many people know that. Uh, but when he did that, he certainly brought in a lot of things from his own experience as basically a game warden um, in rural France. And so uh, sometimes now people look back, oh, yes, actually, he was right. He wasn't just making up this stuff. And probably even earlier times, familiarity with animals was an important part of living in the world. So, so, so thank you again, maybe too much of a rant, and not enough of a question, but thank you. Yeah, I love, I love that fable as well. And I wrote a little bit about it in, um, for my dissertation, I had this whole chapter that was mm. about the beetles. And then, so I had the, I had the peasant and the beetle and then the, um, wolf and the beetle, but I also wrote about this one. And I think this one is interesting because I also, my impression is that envy plays such a role and i linked it back to curiosity by arguing that like there's also like discourses on how curiosity that's motivated by envy isn't mm. like is not a not a good thing but also there's some kind of a kind of loving maybe that's too much projection but a kind of like affectionate way that marie describes the beetle it's um it, it ha it's little mound like it's the word that I think she uses to describe his little dunghill is like a little mountain and then it has like a nice like a glistening body and so like in spite of the beetle's own push to feel that it's not um it wants to be an eagle it doesn't want to be a beetle like it still has like this nice little song it has a little glistening body it has a cute it's a nice little mountain and a community of other beetles and it's when it tries to get beyond that and um have this kind of curiosity or care motivated by envy is when it kind of goes astray and it's like oh no i miss my dunghill thank you jane just had to unmute sorry abby i absolutely loved your talk every aspect of it from the very beginning <laughs> and i fell for the trick as i'm sure many other people did mm -hmm. Um, which immediately made me think about media and the role that media plays in sort of directing the eye and also in what it means to live in such an intensely hypervisual culture. So that's one direction that I'm coming from. I was also really struck by the um, resonance of what you're doing with uh, the book that everybody is reading now, Ed Young's The An Immense World, um, which is about how expanding our sense of how animals sense the world can you know, reveal the world that we live in in new ways. Um, and the third thing, just from a point of view thing, is uh, my field is um, 18th century literature. So I'm coming at this uh, from a very different perspective. But, um, uh, you know, my first book was on the fable craze in the 18th century. Um, as Georges sort of alluded, it's in this period that um, Ray de France begins to be translated in England as well as um, in, in modernized in France. Um, and there's been just so much really interesting work in the field pertinent to what you're doing, um, it, a lot of which also turns on this question of sort of visuality and what it means to be in a really visual culture. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating about insects is their invisibility, um, kind of literally. I mean, they have the most infinitesimal um, you know, sort of as citizens of the animal world, the hardest to see unless they form into collectives, right? Or unless they touch us in ways other than visual, which is kind of what's happening in these in these fables, which are also just really interesting in terms of the fact that both of them begin with somebody asleep, you know, and then there's that sort of, you know, which problematizes the senses. So um, I, that's kind of rambling. And I just to get very much to the point and what my questions are really almost kind of factual questions. Um, so one, one aspect is, 
I'm really interested in your sense of who the reader is of these books in the first place, this book in the first place, and how it's read, right? And just the whole, you know, status of the illuminated manuscript, which can actually, I think, be perceived in spite of the appeal to the eye in many ways that are, you know, sort of tactile and non-visual. You know, you're talking about very limited literacy, so a lot of people would have heard the fable. Um, so I, I'm just really curious about how other sensory registers within the fable and also within the medium of the fable might be impinging on um, what, what uh, Marie de France is doing and you know, potentially participating in what you just laid out so beautifully as her ethical project, um, which is to think in this more collocative way as opposed to this sort of fragmented insecticidal way. You know? um, so, but, but, but I'm just interested in how you think about the other sensory registers, pain is mentioned, you know, uh, that might be working in the presentation of this. And, and I was like, well, are beetles blind, right? And so, uh, but they're actually not. They have a really acute sense of smell, but there's a whole iconography of the beetle, I think, which based on how they move and how we see them, that has led us not to see them. So I don't know if that also is part of something that's going on in these fables or not, um, you know, maybe within the bestiaries, if there's a whole way of thinking about the beetle that, that de France, Marie de France is drawing on. But anyway, it's just other sensory registers and how we could use them um, as part of this ethical project that you're laying out so brilliantly. And I did really, really love your talk. So sorry for a long-winded question. I really apologize. No, thank you. Yeah, so in terms of your question about who's a reader, um, there's a tension, I think, in um, or had been has been a tension in reading the Marie de France's fables because her audience would have been like pretty aristocratic, I guess, like upper class um, folks who would have had access to like these really beautiful manuscripts or had had these as presents. And so um, there's on there's been ongoing debate about like what about class in the in the fables and like what does she mean when she assigns like different class values to different creatures and I think what's what's been interesting to me about the wolf and the beetle in particular and it's about how that gets disrupted in some way it's, you have like um, animals that are more associated with these kinds of upper class registers that are being challenged directly by um, insects that have been often regarded as invisible or unseen or even disregarded. So that to me is um, like a really interesting um, question that I'm continuing to think through. But yeah, about the other sensory registers, um, I think, yeah, I think that's a good question. My my presentation does focus a lot on sight and seeing and what do we look at and how do we look at things and what do things look like so um yeah I, I'll I'll continue to think about about that yeah all right thank you thank you so much buddy oh I have you so I have to say your uh your lecture today and your research really resonated with the uh the topic of humanities core at uh, UC Irvine um, last year was animals, people, and power, and we actually we actually read some um, some Marie de France. Um, but what it it really resonated, um, your work resonated with um, the work that Gabby Schwab from Comparative Literature uh, presented last term, and she actually. Um, works with Donna Haraway sometimes. Um, but uh, Professor Schwab talked about a new ontology and a transspecies, the idea of developing a transspecies existence. Um, and in the course, we sort of looked at it as a modern phenomenon. Um, but what I'm seeing in, in your analysis of the fables is that it's not necessarily um, a new thing. and um, I think it's helpful to think about a longer history of theorizing transspecies existence. Um, but it also particular, if you're, are you familiar with the uh, Miyazaki's film, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so I feel like your lecture today for me really resonated with that. Um, that Nausicaa is 
she's driven by her curiosity and she doesn't go like a, like in the fable she doesn't go along with the villagers she doesn't just buy the beliefs and assumptions but is curious and actually goes out to uh mm -hmm. to meet the insects um so i just thought they that it like it nicely resonated with some of that last year and it's um it's too bad you couldn't have been here last year because it um it would have really helped the students i think looking at mm -hmm. marie france's fables and thinking about how it's not just anthropomorphized animals but um thank you thank you buddy could you put that film title in the chat that would sure. be really helpful um uh alia hi thanks um this is so interesting, and I am curious about so many aspects of your work, um, but also the fact that, you know, when you talk about like coalition building and like building of like relationships between, you know, um, perhaps like adversaries or just, you know, like, can you speak to, and given especially the work that you currently do, um, what are the resonances between your the work that you did in your dissertation and the work that you currently do? And and um, how, can you talk a little bit about yeah your your path from um, yeah what what this topic was about and and the research that you're currently doing? Yeah, so I um, I love this question because um, so I current for people that don't know I currently work at the Center for Popular Democracy. Um, it's a it's a base building organization with lots of um, affiliate organizations across uh, 48, 48 organizations across 33 states and Puerto Rico. So a lot of what we do is like trying to figure out what it means to be a national network and what does it mean to um, coalition build, but also make decisions effectively that are co-creative and often, um, yeah, and often with, with you know, like in a non hierarchical, non um, top down kind of way. So I was just thinking about that ag again when um, I was I was giving my paper because like a lot of the a lot of the challenges of um, making decisions with other people is that like everyone and and. Oh yeah, you you probably know this as well. It can be challenging to get everyone kind of on the same page because people have so many different interests and motivations and reasons for doing things. And then how do you get everyone to kind of work towards the same goal? And yeah, so in my research, like a lot of the work that I currently do is also trying to identify things like corporate targets or try to do strategic research that helps support the work that um affiliates are trying to do in the ground to mobilize their base and to also figure out like the best mess messaging and the best kind of decision making to kind of make that happen. So in terms of like the way the dissertation relates to that, I don't actually do any medieval stuff at the Center for Popular Democracy, but I think like a lot of that bleeds back and forth into like thinking about like mutual aid, collective care, what does it mean to care for other people, but also what does it mean to push back against um, all of like the different kinds of voices that are, you know, like hierarchical and damaging and individualistic. Thank you. That's really, it's really interesting to think about Marie um, in these terms because she, especially in the fables, but even, even in the lays and elsewhere, she's so interested in hierarchy and in criticizing it. Um, she's, uh, I mean, that was sort of what I was thinking as you were, as you, as your talk went on was um, kind of about the way in which the sort of getting back to Deanna's question, um, the way in which the sort of animal human allegories um, slip and allow us to um, kind of see hierarchy differently. Um, but she obviously isn't um, working in, a, in policy work and 
there's a difference between noting critiques of hierarchy on the one hand and on the other hand, um, uh, pushing against hierarchy more systemically. Um, so I, it just that just makes me um, think about things. Um, Nancy, I'm sorry to <laughs> disrupt the order of events. No, no um, I appreciate uh, what you just said. Um, I want to say I also really, really loved this talk. It was so exciting. Um, my brain is kind of exploding right now, so I might not be as clear as I as I want. Um, I particularly love the talk because I've been working with very didactic, I would even say anti-curiosity <laughs> um, sources, because I've been working with um, de Gilville's uh, Pilgrimage of Human Life, which is very much don't look at the world, you know, um, <laughs> kind of uh, bind all your senses and make sure you don't sin so you can go to heaven. So I, I love, I love this. And I also love the very provocative issue of having a beetle up your butt <laughs> because it's, it really tears apart any kind of um, in, an idea of individual integrity. Um, and uh and and it does so so comically, um, especially with the the wolf fable. Uh, what I I'm thinking about, you know, I, I raised my hand a while ago, so I'm trying to bring it back. Um, thinking about uh, also just how this connects to your last question about living with species that could be harmful to us, because it seems that the curiosity that the pilgrim and the pilgrimage of human life is is trying to overcome you know i want to make sure these bad things don't happen to me <laughs> in his case sins and the curiosity of the people looking at the man with the beetle up his butt you know the vain curiosity is again kind of like oh look what's happening to him i want to make sure this doesn't happen to me and the curiosity of all the animals is i want to make sure this doesn't happen to me and the bugs are perfect because we kill bugs even though they're all dying and um when they get into places they shouldn't be even houses or people's food or whatever we freak out never mind having them climb up our butt which we probably don't have to deal with as much because we live in such a sterilized environment so i'm just wondering about this kind of fear <laughs> and maybe you've already said this because um about this, this fear of oh I don't want this to happen to me and how that plays into your ideas about coalition building and also interspecies gaze because I feel like that can be a very paralyzing fear and the beetle up the butt kind of clarifies it in a, in a big way all these animals with their blood Butts. I mean, so I, I just I know that you're kind of we're touching on it, but if you if you wanted to come back to it more forcefully, I would love to hear what you had to say. Yeah, I think that's a I that's a really interesting question. And I like the way like that you framed it in terms of like I don't like this is not something I want to happen to me. And yeah, I'm not really sure yet what um how how to answer that yet because i think there's something interesting happening in the wolf and the beetle where um this is probably going like way more into like the allegory kind of frame it's like i don't want to be bothered or inconvenienced or to know about like these other creatures that are also living in the world with me that's also kind of happening and um the what's significant i think about the beetle is that it forces the wolf to notice it and to look at it more closely and not this is a bit of a stretch i keep on thinking about this in terms of the ways in which um, even in contemporary movement work, 
we want to be noticed, whether that's by someone who's a decision maker or someone in power who can help us in some way or to at least not make life worse for us. And maybe that's also like some something underpinning this is is the desire not to be inconvenienced, but also the need in some ways to be inconvenienced as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I thought you were going to say the need to be recognized. <laughs> um, I thought you were saying a different, a bit of a different thing. Well, that, yeah, that, that yeah. too is like the need, um, depending on whose perspective you're inhabiting. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Vivian? Yeah. Uh, um, I had a I had I took down my hand and then after Nancy spoke and you mentioned democracy, it came back in. What I thought about today, thinking about the beetle, whom we see as, or which, whom I say in honor of you, I think of as impenetrable with a shell we don't recognize. Mm. In terms of democracy, in terms of, I think, alien and while the grasshopper and the ant that George mentioned belong in fable land to the same imagined, imagined world the beetle and the human do not and what I am thinking of today in terms of hierarchy and democracy is the way immigrants as seen as alien creatures, sometimes called by animal names. And so the fear of penetration has to me a resonance that I think it would not have had five years ago in terms of what is this alien creature that I'm supposed to recognize as belonging to my world, if I belong to the animal world, but yet I don't is that what my fear is when I say my, I don't mean my personally necessarily, but the way people think of, of people coming into their worlds who are not invited or acknowledged or recognized or wanted and who seem completely impenetrable and alien to them. So you're, you're presenting your talk in context of your interests, your social interests in democracy and in the social world we live in, as well as the animal world that Buddy framed for us was extremely moving to me. I, I see it, I see it. And I know Marie de France lived in a world where alien beings coming into the Abbey, <laughs> the community would have been recognized as strange. So I just wonder, I don't know. I'll have to follow your work to find out. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It's so interesting the way that we, um, you know, the the very act of reading this fable, especially in a manuscript that's as gorgeous as this one, is always an act of um, interpretation, but also of allegorizing, right? Um, and it's almost impossible to avoid that. Um, in fact, you're talking about fables that themselves ask for it. Um, and so I guess my, my, my question is kind of, I mean, I, I hear the anti-allegorizing impulse in what you're saying, Abby. Um, and I hear it in the context of like larger questions that um, animal and environmental um, scholarship has um, asked. Um, 
but I'm wondering how you want to negotiate that. Like, what um, what do you do instead? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think what I like about the um, the fables is that it's also not either or. There's an allegory, but the allegory wouldn't make sense. Um, without also understanding what the insect is as like a material creature. Mm -hmm. And I see this in my in my own work on the bestiaries and insects in the bestiaries. It's like sometimes there's like this kind of push pull where you have an allegory, but then also the allegory and the actual material reality of what an insect is is what helps support that allegory and makes it meaningful. And so I am especially interested in how it's not like either one thing or just the other thing, but how those two things come together to make meaning. And the example I'm thinking of, and this is like far afield of fable, but um, the Fasiologus has this example of the fig tree. And then it's like this whole like allegory of these little figs that are little fig wasps inside the figs and then you cut the fig out and the like the wasps come out but they're also like important in pollinating the plant and um writers and naturalists at the time knew that and so you have this whole allegory of like how it's like related to like knowledge and sin and salvation and they're kind of being illuminated by like this other world that you didn't even know about like the you were sitting in the it's sort of like Plato's cave almost like Plato's cave and then you have like little fig wasps in the fig and then they're like this is we're inside a dark place and then you open the fig and they're like now we see the sun moon and the stars but it's also it wouldn't really work without understanding like all these this stuff about like the life cycle of a fig and how like you have a fig farmer I guess and then the person that grows the figs and then the the wasps and the plant and then all of those kind of coexisting together to also create this beautiful allegory so I think that's what interests me at, at this moment is like, it's not discarding the allegory altogether, but also how do these like material elements of the natural world help to make this meaning on many different levels? That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for a wonderful talk and a really interesting discussion afterwards, Abby. It's been really a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Abby. There was a question in the chat asking for oh. a title. Yeah, I think it was answered. I think Buddy, the Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. No, I think I thought it was about? something else, but I lost it. Uh, <laughs> oh, here it is. Could you add the name of the fig allegory? It's the physiologus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I can't imagine a better start for our series this year, Abby, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a lot of different people coming from different directions to this talk. So we are uh, doubly sorry that we didn't get to be with you in, in person either last year or for this talk, but we hope you'll let us know if you're in California and, and we, we will all be following your work now, I think, because uh, it's so engaged all of us and it, it's important on so many different levels. So. Yeah, thanks again, Abby. Thank you, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming. It was great to see you all here. Good great discussion, I thought. Yeah, yeah, very good. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>